Over the past year or so, I've seen so many people throwing around the term decentralization. It seems to be the new hot term. Whether that is just regular people or even companies. Companies absolutely adore it as a marketing term. You'll have decentralized social media, decentralized video sharing, decentralized currency. Everything needs to be decentralized. And not a single person, especially marketing departments, take a second to actually explain what they mean by decentralization because saying decentralized doesn't have one set definition even in the tech space. Because no one else seems to be doing it to clear up confusion, I'm going to define two new terms relevant to the tech world. Physical decentralization and organizational decentralization. Now, there is going to be a lot of overlap between the two types of decentralization, but they will be very clearly different categories. Let's start with physical decentralization because this is how the term was traditionally used. And if you've done any sort of higher education in say like a software engineering degree or a computer science degree, you've probably heard decentralization be used like this. Let's say you have a web server and you need to account for a higher capacity of users. So there's two ways you can go and approach this. Firstly, you can have a server and make it bigger and bigger and bigger as you need to account for more users by adding in higher and higher end components. This has two obvious problems. One is it gets very, very expensive really quickly. The other one is at some point there won't be higher end components and you can't make the capacity any larger. So the other approach we have is just add in more servers and then distribute the load between each of the servers. Nowadays, that might seem kind of obvious and there's a lot of software that helps you manage that, but this is an approach that was popularized by Google because making Google search function basically required it. Having these multiple servers is physical decentralization. Now, how the servers are arranged very much depends on what you're trying to achieve. So you might have multiple servers in the same server rack, or they might be in different buildings, or they might be in different countries. It really depends on what the requirements for the project actually are. One question that is very difficult to answer though, which is also going to apply to organizational decentralization, is if you look at two projects, which one is more decentralized? So if you have say 100 servers, but they're all in the exact same building, is that more decentralized or less decentralized at having 25 servers, but each of them are located in different countries? Well, what are you trying to achieve? Let's say you're trying to have a data backup, for example. In that case, I think it might be better to have the data in 25 different countries. So if one of the data centers burned down, you don't lose all of the data. In the first case, even though there's more servers, there's nothing that's going to save that data if it's in the same place. But if you're trying to do some parallel computing, let's say you're Disney, for example, and you want to render a feature-length film, each of the frames in a movie like that takes a very long time to render, and you probably want to have as many servers as possible to break down as much of the work as possible. Now, all of that stuff is also going to apply to organizational decentralization. The big difference, though, is in the ownership of the servers. So typically, people are going to say things like, YouTube is centralized and Facebook is centralized and Twitter is centralized. But if we look at how they're actually operating, YouTube isn't running on a single server. Twitter isn't on a single server. Facebook isn't on a single server, so on and so forth. All of these big websites are not on single servers. That would be absolutely insane. These are physically decentralized, but owned by the same organization. All of these services are running on data centers all around the world. So you can have things like the Australian version of YouTube, the American version, the Canadian version, and offer specialized content for those regions. But even so, in those regions, they're running multiple instances of the same service in that data center. So let's say in the Sydney data center for YouTube, they might have 50 servers for YouTube, probably way more than that, but you sort of get the point. They're not just running one instance of YouTube. Things like this are usually referred to as decentralized in the corporate context and the education context. And I guarantee I'm going to get hate comments explaining to me why YouTube is not decentralized. And that's because most general people use decentralization in the organizational form where you don't have a single unit of control. While services like Twitter are physically decentralized, so if one of the data centers they're in has a power outage or a fire, 
Twitter should just keep running. Twitter also has the power to shut down every single one of their servers tomorrow, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is where the difference actually shines. So, in something like Mastodon, this isn't actually possible. If you don't know, Mastodon is basically a FOSS version of Twitter, so even if the developers of Mastodon say, okay, we're taking down the code base and we think everyone should go and shut down their instance because going forward, there's not going to be any development and things may be insecure, they can't stop you from actually running that instance. If you have the software, you can just go and run a new one. And if the instance you're on shuts down, you can go and start up your own. So no single person or organization has the power to go and shut down every single Mastodon instance tomorrow. The only way to shut down Mastodon is to shut down every single instance of Mastodon individually across every country in the world. It also doesn't have a central point of authority that can ban you from Mastodon. The worst that can happen to you is you can be banned from Bob's Mastodon instance, and if that's the case, you can just go over to someone else's, and if you get banned from there, you can go somewhere else, and you can just keep doing this until you get banned from every single server on the world, and if that happens, well, now you can just go and run your own, and no one can ban you. Because of the open protocol that Mastodon runs, it doesn't just have to connect to other Mastodon instances. So there's another software called Pleroma, which is basically the same thing, but highly customizable. And you can also talk to people on that as well. So this gives you a lot of control of how you actually want to use this software. A really great example of an organizationally decentralized architecture is a pure peer-to-peer -peer architecture. I mean pure by not having some overseer watching the network that can remove users at will. So in this architecture, basically users, instead of connecting to one central server, they all connect to each other instead. So this basically forms a web of connections. This is how a lot of early multiplayer games actually worked. This kind of decentralization is what's favored in the FOSS world as well as the crypto world. Now, speaking of crypto, let's go through a crypto example. Let's say we have two projects. Both the projects can be mined. Neither of them have a massive pre-mint. Everything starts from zero when the project goes public. So in the first project, the only people that are allowed to mine the coin are those that have been accepted by the project and no one else can do it. The other project is something more akin to Bitcoin where anybody out there can go and start up a miner tomorrow and then start mining the coin for themselves. So in this case, if there's a bunch of people actually doing it, both of these are physically decentralized but only one of them is organizationally decentralized and the one that is going to be accepted by the crypto world is going to be the second one. The first one feels like the developers of the project are trying to do something kind of scammy. Maybe they're trying to run away with the coins. You don't really know why they need authorization for you to actually mine. It seems kind of weird. Technically, in both cases, the owners of the project don't actually own the miners, but in the first case, because the owners do need to give explicit permission to the miners, they basically act as the de facto owners. They act as a gateway that stops any regular people from getting involved. This is especially important in projects where owning a percentage of the mining pool or a percentage of the token gives you a certain amount of voting power in the project. So in the case of the first one, if the project doesn't like how you're voting, they could just go and kick you out of the mining pool. Ultimately though, regardless of the type of decentralization, decentralization is a gradient, so you can have more or less decentralization. So in the crypto example, you're probably going to expect the company to have some of their own miners running, and this will make it less organizationally decentralized, but as long as they don't have a majority, most people are still going to consider that actually decentralized. Like with blockchains, decentralization gets touted as the cure-all for every project, but even though it does have a lot of benefits, there are some serious drawbacks that do come along with it as well. Things like data management becomes much harder, security is harder, pushing out updates to every single one of the servers, inherently harder. But if it is the right thing for your project, maybe consider getting your servers from Linode. If it runs on Linux, you can run it on Linode. They have the distros you'd expect available like Ubuntu and Debian, but also Arch and Gentoo because 
why not? They've got multiple server plans available, so whether you want to host a blog or even a personal VPN, there'll be one that fits you. I'll be using Linode to host all of my community game nights. If you need help, Linode has 24-7, 365 support available by phone, regardless of your plan size. Right now, you guys can get started on Linode with $100 credit by going to the link on screen or in the description down below. Linode was in the game three years before Amazon entered cloud computing, so you know they know their stuff. A huge thank you to Linode for sponsoring the channel. That'll be everything for me, and before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Yoa Kim, Donald Logan, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Carl, Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Josh, Mitchell, Peter D, Stephen T, Saru, Tony Tushar, and all of my two dollars supporters. If you'd like to go support, work the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave a pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. I also have a gaming channel where I do gaming live streams twice a week. That is Brody Robertson Plays. That is on YouTube and Twitch. And this channel is over on Odyssey as well. So that's everything for me and I'm out.